Good morning. How are we doing today? South Florida AGC, South Florida Safety Pros, and pros throughout the state of Florida. Welcome to the first Second Wednesday Safety Session of 2021. We are very happy to have you here with us. You know, I said earlier, welcome to folks from, from around the state. Uh, this forum using uh, this technology has really allowed us to reach folks in Tampa, Orlando, and Jacksonville. And uh, we're grateful to be able to spread uh, the safety message that our organization has been a big part of, and you guys have been a big part of, because if it wasn't for you all um, and your participation and your driving what we do, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this and help so many folks in the construction industry throughout the state. So thank you all very much. Uh, we're broadcasting live, so more thank yous from uh, the studios at Safe Right Solutions. They've given us their training room. You all know this uh, for quite some time. So thank you to Andres uh, and his entire team. I also want to recognize the team at Kelly Cronenberg who have been so, so wonderful with us sharing their technology, helping me run the show here. Um, and that's Tim and Cedric over at their offices in Davie. Thank you both so much. We appreciate having your help. And today we get a little extra help from Angela, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, before we get to our guests today, uh, we do have a word from our title sponsor. Um, we're very grateful to the team over at Milwaukee Tools uh, for their support of what we do here. Their financial support is important, especially now that we need to have broadcast equipment. So thank you to them and their team. Um, we've got the great Uriel Soto, another sad Dallas Cowboys fan. Uh, but we love you nonetheless, Uriel. We love you nonetheless. So, uh, Uriel Soto, please uh, unmute yourself and take it away, man. What do you want to talk to us about this uh, this fine morning? All right. Good morning. We're going to make it short and sweet. You know, definitely hoping that everybody got their 2021 off to a great start. Um, here at the Milwaukee team, we're definitely excited to, to start off the year at the golf tournament coming up in about two weeks. So, hoping to see a lot of uh, the, the South Florida AGC members out there. Um for us in 2021, we're expecting to continue to put out a lot of new products that are going to make your job sites a lot more productive, a lot safer, from safety, uh, PPE, to um, uh, no emissions um, tools, to even joining and partnering up with Equipment Share to help you guys with those heavier equipments, following up with those, and then the billing process as well. A um, couple other great things that we're doing, uh, partnering up with the Coastal team, uh, on a tool lanyard program, we're basically seeding a couple tool lanyards on a couple of their sites. They're allowing their subs to use them and therefore creating another a, a safer environment at that job site. But uh, other than that, we're definitely excited to get back out there, get in front of the members, uh, join these events, and then kind of get back to a little bit of normalcy. We are definitely seeing that uh, the work is picking up and we're excited to, to be there and support you all. If there's any safety training that we could help you out with on the sites or at the warehouse, please feel free to reach out to myself or someone from the team. And uh, thank you very much again, Carlos. Definitely appreciate the support and looking forward to a great 2021. No, we, we appreciate you. Hey, Uriel, if somebody wants to reach you, what's the best way to reach you? It's going to be through email, uh, uriel.soto at milwaukeetool.com or via cell phone, which is 954-649-0891. And, and Uriel is U-R-I-E-L. Correct. Gotcha. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, Uriel. Appreciate it, man. So um, very excited to get to our presentation today. OSHA record keeping is something all of you have to deal with in one form or another. Uh, our safety committee felt that this was a great topic to start off the year with, and we have two fantastic guests to walk us through today's topic. Uh, Angelo Filippi is someone who is well known within our community because he's a great attorney who knows his stuff. Uh, he is a partner at Kelly Cronenberg, focusing his practice on employment and labor law, as well as OSHA defense. Uh, he has presented to our group in the past several times, and uh, everybody loved the Ask Angelo sessions that we would have after our presentations over at Kelly Cronenberg. Um, and we're very grateful to have Angelo again with us this morning. Thank you, Angelo. I know you're busy. Um, Gabriel Garcia, Gabriel Garcia, another member of our community, serves as the USF Safety Florida Safety and Health Director 
to employers in South Florida. In fact, I had a safety director on this morning uh, with us with all these great uh, awards that he got from USF behind him with a lot of pride. And, and absolutely, those, those are awesome awards to have. Gabe started his health and safety career in 1981 with the U.S. Air Force. Thank you for your service, Gabe. Uh, since then, he has put together over 30 years of public health, environmental health, emergency management, and occupational health and safety experience, including working for both the 482nd Medical Squadron and the 482nd Civil Engineers as their safety manager and the FDOH as its emergency coordinator. Uh, this is quite the duo that we have presenting to you today. Uh, Gabe, please go ahead and get things kicked off. We should have the PowerPoint up and running right now. The floor is yours, guys. Can you guys see my screen? <clears throat> we can. Great. Um, thank you, Carlos, for that uh, awesome introduction. Just let me know how much I owe you afterwards. Um, <laughs> um, with that in mind, um, once again, thank you and everybody welcome to the uh, OSHA Records Keeping. This is going to be an overview. I want to put a disclaimer first. Uh, first of all, uh, myself and Angela are going to be talking for, you know, a little bit less than an hour on this topic. And this is actually a four hour topic if you take the, uh, the OSHA uh, course. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end, which we do one, uh, have one coming up. Hi. So the uh, purpose of this rule, uh, 1904, is to require uh, employers to record and report work-related fatalities, injuries, and illnesses. This does not mean that when you report this to OSHA, that means that the employer was at fault or that any of the OSHA rules has been violated or that the employee is eligible for work compensation or other benefits. <clears throat> This is very, very important to know. Everybody thinks that when you're reporting uh, some, you know, the OSHA, you're going to get in trouble. Well, no, you're actually reporting what just happened and then um, uh, an evaluation of the injury or illnesses will, will dictate what happens afterwards. But another thing we wanted to make clear, and I think Angela will probably talk a little bit more about this, is the difference between OSHA injuries, illness recording, and workers' compensation. They are totally independent of each other. As with anything else, uh, records keeping does have exceptions. Uh, in this case, um, records keeping uh, based on the size of the employer, uh, if you get 10 or less, uh, you may or may not be required to. Uh, you also have partial, which is based on specific in AICSs, but you still can be requested to do so. And last but not least, it's based on in, uh, industry. Unfortunately, all construction, uh, agriculture, manufacturing, and utilities and wholesale trades are covered under this uh, um, uh, section. Recording criteria. All employees identified under this uh, um, 1904 must record each facility, injury or illnesses. That is first of all, work related. Second of all, it's a new case. And third of all, meets one or more criteria contained in section 1907 and 19, through 1904.11. And um, those includes uh, general industry, uh, general recording criteria, needle sticks, um, the medical removal and hearing loss and TB, tuberculosis. Um, not to, to go through the entire thing, but this is pretty much a definition of work relatedness. If you look down at the red um, uh, lettering on the bottom, it's just pretty much any event or exposure that occurs during the work environment, in the work environment. <clears throat> so, Gabriel, I'm going to go ahead. jump in here. Um, you can hear me, right? Everybody yes, can sir. hear me? 
All right, this is Angelo. Thanks for having me this morning. Um, there's a lot of um, words in there that have significant meanings, and I wanted to point some of them out, and I wanted to give you some examples, because it's important uh, first to determine whether the uh, uh, injury or illness uh, was work-related, okay? And so, Let's talk first about the definition. Uh, you consider an injury or illness to be work-related if an event or exposure in the work environment either caused or contributed. And I want to stop there. What OSHA says is that it's not the cause or the contributing factor. It is a cause or a contributing factor. So there could be other factors that cause the illness or injury, uh, as long as one of those factors was an event or exposure in the work environment, it's work-related. Then you go on and, and it says that uh, the resulting condition uh, or significantly aggravated a pre-existing injury or illness. And we're going to talk about that a little more in a little more detail. What's important here is that work-relatedness is presumed for injuries and illnesses resulting from events or exposures occurring in the work environment, unless an exception in B2 applies. And I wanted to go over a couple of the exceptions, um, one of them being that um, the injury or illness involves signs or symptoms that surface at work, but result solely from a non-work related event or exposure that occurs outside the work environment or that the, was that the employee was doing personal tasks at the establishment outside of the employee's assigned working hours or that the illness is the common cold or flu. But they note that contagious diseases, and, and we'll talk about that bad word, uh, COVID, um, uh, are considered work-related if the employee is infected at work, and we'll go through that. Then finally, mental illness uh, is not considered work-related unless there's an opinion from a physician uh, stating that the employee has a mental illness that is work-related. Okay. So what happens where a worker has warned his work groups to apply a, a sealer to his pavers at home. Then he goes to work, and as a result of the sealer being on his work boots, he falls and injures himself at the work site. Is that work related? I don't know of how many of you would consider that work related, uh, but the problem is, is if you look technically at the definition, none of the exceptions apply. So if you read the definition technically, it's work related and has to be recorded. But, and there's always a but with us lawyers, Let's give you another example. There's an ep let's say someone has uh, an epileptic seizure at work, which results in a fall, and the employee breaks his arm. There's actually an OSHA interpretation here, okay? Um, and in the OSHA interpretation, they point to that exemption that I mentioned that where the injury or illness involves signs or symptoms that surface at work, but results solely from non-work related event or exposure. Now, there was no non-related event or exposure. Nevertheless, here OSHA says that because the, or even though the broken arm occurred in the workplace, It is clearly not recordable because it resulted in an injury at the, uh, 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 it results in uh, an injury uh, or resulted from a sign or symptom 
that is solely not work related. And, and if you take that example and apply it to our first instance, again, the sealer that was stuck to the shoes occurred outside the workplace. So in this situation or in both situations, uh, and certainly in the situation with the epileptic seizure where OSHA has specifically said it's not recordable, I do not believe the first instance is recordable either. What happens where, let's say you have a superintendent on the job um, who has a sore elbow uh, from playing tennis. He comes to work and he picks up a drill and hands it to a worker. And that results in an aggravation of his tennis elbow that is enough to result in medical treatment. Is that recordable? Well, the question becomes, is that a significantly aggravating uh, a pre-existing injury? And in that situation, believe it or not, OSHA says that is recordable because it is a significant aggravation uh, because on the B4, it results either in restricted work or medical treatment, okay? And so if the superintendent was not treated previously for the pain in his elbow resulting from his um, outside of work activities, but comes to work and there's an incident or in uh, a... Um, uh, environment or exposure or event that either was a cause or a contribution. And in this instance, picking up the, the tool was significant. It was, was, was the action that resulted in him having to seek medical treatment. It aggravated his injury. OSHA says that's an ins a significant aggravation because he required medical treatment as a result of that act. Therefore, it is recordable. So at first glance, there are issues that are going to occur whenever you have an incident at work. And I'm going to go through a few more as we go along to, 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 to help us understand this, but uh, make sure that you understand that significantly aggravated means simply that if the act or incident had resulted in medical treatment, regardless of whether, you know, uh, 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 you believe that it was a pre-existing injury that had nothing to do with work, if there was something that they can point to that says, well, because I lifted that tool or because I lifted that box or whatever, I had to go to the uh, doctor and he had to treat me. That's gonna be a recordable event. Thanks, Angelo. And just to add, by the way, very quickly, folks, if you have questions uh, that are pertinent to OSHA record keeping, please go ahead and post them on there. And to the joker who sent me the text message, no, I'm not sure how many superintendents play tennis uh, on the regular. So, you know, if you know a tennis playing superintendent, make sure you get them this video once it's available. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe they're playing golf. That mu much more likely. All right, guys, go right ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> go ahead, Gabriel. All right. Um, here, um, let's take a look at the uh, definition for work environment. Um, Work environments is the establishment at other locations where one or more employer employees are working or are present as a condition of their employment. This work environment includes not only physical locations, but also equipments or materials used by the employee during the course of his or her work. I want to, I wanted to jump in there also, Gabe, just to give one example. Uh, a lot of us have uh, employees who are working remotely. And so under those circumstances, once they set up their work environment at home, let's say, uh, or at another work location um, and injure themselves there, it's possibly work-related. When I say possibly, I mean, uh, I'll give you the two extreme examples. If 
they're working from home and they trip over their dog, that's not work related. If they're working at home and they plug in their computer to start working and get shocked, that is work related. Uh, and so the remote location, you have to look at the circumstances to determine whether or not they're engaged in a work activity <clears throat> of any type when the, the accident occurs or the injury occurs to determine whether or not it's work related. But the home base, so to speak, um, um, is an environment that or a work environment rather. Okay, Gabriel. So in order to determine if the process or if the injury uh, is um, uh, recordable or not, here's a five-step process. If you answer yes to any of these questions, it is recordable. If you answer no to any of these questions, it is not recordable. So the first thing you ask yourself is, did the employee experience an injury or an illness? Yes. If the employee illness uh, work-related, yes. If the employee injuries, is, is it a new case? Yes. Um, and did it meet the general criteria? Yes. Then you go ahead and record this injury. And then here's how we record days away, restricted or transferred. Record if the case involves one or more days away from work. If they come back the next day, you put zero in there. Check the applicability of the OSHA 300 and count the number of days. Do not include, once again, the day of the injury or illness. Count the number of calendar days. That includes everything, weekends, holidays, vacations. And, and this is something that uh, I've seen a lot of people get hung up on. Um, you only cap up to 180 days, days away or restricted. And by the way, you need to keep it also in the year that happened. For example, uh, an employee gets injured in December 5th and doesn't return back to work till January 10th. Uh, those 10 days that they spent in January actually needs to be recorded in the, uh, in the previous year where the accident uh, happened. And this is where you go back and address those uh, injuries and you update the, uh, the OSHA 300. Um, you may stop count the day the employee leaves the company for whatever reason, uh, unless it's related to the injury. If it's unrelated, you go ahead and you stop it. If a medical exception, a medical opinion exists, employee must follow that opinion. Restricted work cases. I put a note in here. <clears throat> An employee's routine job functions are those activities the employee's regular performs at least once a week, that's according to OSHA standards. Restrict work activity exists if the employee is unable to work the full work day, he or she would otherwise have been scheduled to work or unable to perform one or more routine job functions. The case is not recordable if the employee experiences just minor musculoskeletal discomfort Healthcare professional determines that the employee is fully able to perform all of his or her routine job functions, and the employer assigns a work restriction to the employee for the purpose of preventing a more serious conditions from developing. Job transfer. This is where a case is recordable if the injury or illness of the Ill, Ill employee performs his or her routine job duty part of the day and is assigned another job for the rest of the day. All right, let's take a look at the difference between now medical treatment and first aid. Medical treatment is the management and care of patients to combat a disease or disorder. It does not include any visit to um, physician solely for observations or counseling. It doesn't include diagnostic procedures and definitely doesn't include first aid. First okay. aid, go ahead. Can we go back to that job transfer slide a second? I want to make Absolutely. a couple of comments on that. <clears throat> 
So as Gabe said, a case is recordable if the injured ill employee performs his or her routine job duties for part of a day and is assigned to another job for the rest of the day. Uh, there are some significant issues that occur. A lot of us have uh, light duty assignments, particularly where we have uh, um, a workers' comp claim that occurs <laughs> as a result of the injury or illness. Um, uh, workers' comp, as you know, uh, is implicated whenever there is an injury or illness uh, uh, that occurs in the workplace and uh, in, in cases where you have an employee who uh, is reassigned, let's say, to another job uh, in order to avoid uh, indemnity benefits. Because all, as most of us know, I think that if you have indemnity benefits being paid, that has the greatest effect on your mod in a workers' comp scenario. Now... The other issue I wanted to raise here is, you know, particularly if you have a light duty um, policy or practice, and uh, this is a little bit outside topic, but it's important because situations where the employee has a chronic musculoskeletal injury, for example, uh, where you've recorded it, uh, and it's also a workers' comp matter, but you've assigned them to a job uh, for light duty, you need to make sure that your light duty policy has a cap. Uh, and the reason for that is because if the injury or illness is such that it could be considered a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act, then that transfer if it looks like a job that can be performed permanently and the employee's uh, restrictions uh, as they tend to do uh, drag out for months or even years, then placing them in a job uh, for uh, an excess period of time and a lot of, a lot of people cap it at either uh, 120 or 180 days, and that's fine. But if, if you don't, and an employee continues doing that light duty job to av avoid the indemnity, and it goes on for six months or so, it may be looked at uh, as a reassignment uh, which accommodates a disability. And, you, and if it looks too much like a permanent position, then um, uh, it could be considered an accommodation and taking them out of it might re uh, result in a violation of the ADA. So what you wanna make sure is, is that if you have a written light duty program at the very least on the workers' comp, then that is capped. And it has in bold at 20 points that um, it is a temporary position uh, to ensure that you avoid the situation where it's considered an ADA accommodation. Uh, and, and so I just wanted to point that out is on the workers' comp side. Uh, obviously, in, in, as Gabe said, in those situations where you, know, you have to transfer someone to a job, it is a recordable injury. Okay, thanks, Gabe. We can move on. Let's talk a little bit about first aid. Um, these are some of the examples that, um, of first aid uh, that can be given to an employee who has been real. But um, one of the ones that it really it catches my eye a lot, especially when I do visits and, and, and help companies out, is the first one. Uh, using non-prescription medications on non-prescription strength. <clears throat> um, we all know that if, if the doctor prescribes uh, a medication uh, that it's not over the counter, it's, it's an automatic uh, uh, recordable. However, uh, not too many people know also that if you prescribe um, acetaminophen at 800 mega, um, uh, uh, 800 uh, uh, pills, uh, they don't have to classify that and, and, and they do, 
because once again, you got to take a look at the, the, the medicine. If that medicine is designed to be taken at 200 milligrams and you're taking 800 based on a doctor's recommendation, then it, it would be a recordable. You will okay, document go back or record. One more time. Gabe. Yeah, go ahead. A, a lot of issues here in determining whether or not um, it's first aid or not become more difficult because of confidentiality and HIPAA requirements. And so if, you know, um, you are unsure, um, I think in most situations you have the right particularly if there's a workers' comp claim, um, you or your uh, adjuster has the right to determine whether or not or what type of treatment was provided. Because uh, a lot of times, a lot of employers are reticent about going in and asking medical questions either of the employee or of the uh, provider, the medical provider, as to what occurred. Um, as you know, you know, if, you know, uh, situations where uh, an employee uh, is injured and is transported to the hospital, okay, there's a question of whether or not we have to report that to OSHA. And you report that if, in fact, the employee has been admitted. So how do we know they're admitted? Well, we can ask we can call uh, the hospital or the medical center and say, has that individual been admitted to the hospital? Has that individual been receiving uh, certain types of treatments that would not only uh, require reporting or not, but also determine whether or not it's recordable. Um, and so, you know, in a lot of these situations where the employee is going to be out for a period of time and you're unsure uh, whether or not it's recordable, you can ask. The ADA does not prevent you from asking questions when an injury occurs uh, that might or might not be covered under the Disability Act from asking these types of questions from medical providers. Okay, Gabe. Boy, I really want to thank you, Angela. There's not too many times I can do a presentation with a legal expert next to me. <laughs> Once again, loss of consciousness. Um, anytime there's a loss of consciousness at work, it must be uh, recorded. Any significant diagnosed injury or illnesses, the following work-related ones must be recorded at the time of the diagnosis by the physician's licensed healthcare provider cancer, chronic irreversible diseases, punctured eardrums, and a fractured or a cracked bone or tooth. Pre-existing uh, conditions. How do I know if an event or exposure in the work environment significantly aggravated your pre-existing um, in your illness? Um, Angela, you, you talked about that um, at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you're looking there at the, the definition where pre existing injury illness has significantly aggravated. Uh, um, it, it's going to need to be recorded. Um, um, if the injury uh, or if the event or exposure results in death, loss of consciousness, um, um, the, the next slide, um, one or more days away from work. Uh, and medical treatment, okay? In, in a case where no medical treatment was needed for the injury or illness before, and that was my, my uh, <clears throat> example with the uh, superintendent who uh, was either playing golf or tennis, um, depending upon your point of view, uh, and uh, um, went to work, lifted a box, lifted a tool, lifted something, uh, which aggravated it enough that it required medical treatment. And so that's why I came to the conclusion there that that was a recordable event. But let's, let me give you uh, one or two other examples. Um, let's say the employee comes to work uh, and he's sweating profusely. 
um, a coworker notices, uh, and then the employee puts on PPE. Let's say he's um, uh, in the electrical field, he's putting on rubber boots, rubber gloves, a slicker suit, uh, goggles, etc. cetera. Uh, and he continues to say he's not feeling well. And as a result, uh, he's transported. Now, remember, he came to uh, uh, work sweating profusely already. Um, you know, I'm not even going to say what his uh, diagnosis was. It's not necessary in this situation. But the question becomes, is that recordable? Okay. Um, and so in, this is, you know, an actual example from an OSHA interpretation. And there were two OSHA representatives at this meeting. And one said yes. And one said no. And so that's... <laughs> I think illustrates the fact that that a lot of times uh, there are ambiguities here that force us to make a tough decision as to whether or not something is recordable. In this instance, because he was at work and donned his equipment uh, and continued to complain and then was transported and, and received medical treatment, I would um, lean in the direction of recording the incident. Okay. Let's say you have um, uh, uh, a softball. Uh, and, and by the way, the OSHA conclusion in that interpretation after their two uh, um, representatives uh, had different opinions was that it was recordable. What about a softball sh uh, shoulder injury uh, where the employee comes to work, uh, lifts a heavy box, and the next day takes off because he complains about his shoulder? Again, OSHA says that's recordable. Um, here's one that's even more um, ambiguous. Let's say an employee is walking down a hallway. <coughs> Simply from the act of walking, pulls a muscle on his leg. Is that recordable? I'd be interesting to, interested to hear how many people think it is or it isn't. Um, <clears throat> but the answer to that question is, I'm going to give you the typical lawyer answer, maybe. Uh, you really, in that situation, have to look <laughs> at other circumstances. You know, was... Um, uh, whether or not the work environment or the duties of the employee were a cause. Remember, it doesn't have to be the cause, but a cause um, or a contribution. Um, or did it re solely result from non-work related activities? So you look at, you know, the time of day. Was this you know, first thing in the morning? He's walking <clears throat> down, <coughs> down the hall to his uh, work assignment. In that situation, <clears throat> I would say not recordable. But what if he was working during the day, climbing ladders, and, and um, uh, we determined that <clears throat> he was up and down ladders about 30 times at the point in time when he walked down the hallway and hurt himself? And again, I'm giving you extreme examples, but um, that obviously would be recordable. What if he was climbing up and down ladders the day before, cleaning the gutters at his house. We discover that not recordable. Uh, so really, there, there has to be an inquiry here in a situation like this where it's not obvious. He didn't fall. Um, uh, he was simply walking down the hall and, it, and his muscle gave way. Uh, so what, what was happening during in the workplace during that day prior to that that could have been a contribution or a cause of the, um, the muscle pull that required medical treatment. Um, that determines whether or not we're going to record the incident. Um, so in many cases, the you know, pre-existing conditions, it is not a situation where it is definitely not recordable. There could be facts and circumstances. Uh, particularly where there is something that you can point to in terms of job duties in the workplace that put uh, the employee over the top in terms of the 
uh, symptoms and resulted in medical treatment that would make it recordable. Uh, so there has to be a little investigation done uh, in order for us to make the determination uh, with respect to pre-existing conditions. Okay, Gabe. All right, the next hot topic would be COVID-19 COVID recordable illnesses. If the case is, is confirmed, uh, you need a positive uh, test. Uh, the case is work-related as previously defined, and the case involves one or, or more of the general uh, recording criteria uh, set forth in, in 1904.7. Now, one of the things I'd like to make clear, as with any illnesses, <clears throat> which is, you know, uh, tra tracing it down to um, uh, um, work-related, <clears throat> it's a little bit more difficult due to the fact that, once again, this has an incubation period of between 10 and 14 days, and uh, <clears throat> pinpointing where you got this disease, it's, it's really, really hard. So... Um, Maybe Angelo, you can probably throw in a, a couple of your experiences with this. Yeah, I've had more than a couple, uh, believe me, over the last year. Um, you know, the, the, the real question here, again, is work-relatedness. So what OSHA recommends here is that you do an investigation into work-relatedness to determine if it's recordable. Um, you can start simply by asking the employee how he believes or she believes uh, they contracted uh, the illness. Um, you know, review the employee's work environment. Uh, were there any other instances of workers in that environment contracting the illness? Um, you know, if you learn later on that that illness was contracted outside or inside the workplace for sure, uh, you need, you know, if it, if it was, you know, if it was likely that, that it was work-related um, as a result of contract tracing that you perform, um, and that there was close exposure to a particular coworker that had a confirmed case, or um, if you have a, a situation where uh, you have an individual who has frequent contact or exposure to the general public, um, or if you have, um, uh, well, those types of situations generally, I mean, if, it's, if you can say after looking at those situations that it is more likely uh, that it was uh, contracted in the workplace, uh, then it is recordable. Now, I caution you because I, I think it's my opinion that it's very difficult to make that determination, even if you have someone who uh, was within the vicinity and contracted. If, I mean, if you're in an open site, construction site, <clears throat> it is less likely, in my view, that someone is going to contract simply by having um, um, contact with a person who has uh, a known positive result. Um, there's one section here that, that uh, says that, you know, employees COVID-19 is not work-related or is likely not work-related if they're the only worker to contract COVID-19 in the vicinity um, uh, and they don't have frequent contact with the general public, let's say. In that situation, I think, you know, if you have two people in the same vicinity who contracted it, um, one is not recordable and one is, right? Uh, because that first person who got it likely got it from outside the workplace. Then you have to determine if the second person had sufficient contact, um, you know, just because they work on the same work site you know, uh, are they on the same crew? Uh, had they worked together after the first person was, uh, or had a positive result? Um, you look at all the circumstances, and I think more often than not, you're going to determine that it is not work-related. Um, uh, <clears throat> you, you can, most people, um, you know, you're going to find that, you know, if, 
uh, they have associated with someone, a family member, a significant other, a friend uh, um, who is not a coworker, um, and may have exposed the employee. I mean, you, you know, those situations, uh, you have to, you know, rely on the employee and say, hey, you know, has anyone, you know, in your immediate family or uh, have you had contact with anyone else who um, had a positive result in the last uh, 10 days or so? Um, uh, again, it's, 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 it's not an easy situation, but I lean more towards the non-work related than I do to the work related, unless you have really good evidence that, that, that the individual was working closely with someone who uh, you find out had tested positive. Um, for purposes of workers' comp, basically the, the same criteria apply. You want to conduct an investigation to determine if it is work-related. The cases that I have been seeing, uh, because this disease is so virulent and, and easily contracted and, um, uh, and so you know, um, um, prevalent right now in terms of positive results, um, most, if the vast majority of claims that have been brought in the workers' comp arena have been rejected. It's very difficult to prove one way or another whether where the, the uh, uh, incident, let's call it, uh, occurred and which resulted in the uh, virus being transmitted particularly in outside <clears throat> uh, construction work sites. Uh, I think you have a good argument there in most cases that, that uh, it would be difficult to contract unless you have very clear, clear evidence. <coughs> Excuse me, that's a worker's cough. It's not COVID. <laughs> a smoker's cough, rather. <clears throat> um, so... Um, I, I think with regard to, to recordable illnesses and, uh, and although COVID-19 is a flu, it is contagious. So technically under the regs, it would be recordable, but in, in looking at what OSHA has told us, uh, what CDC has told us um, uh, and various other agencies um, dealing with health issues, including the Florida Department of Health, I think you're going to come down to find that in in the vast majority of cases, unless the evidence is absolutely incontrovertible, that it's a, not a recordable event, not uh, a uh, <clears throat> genuine workers' comp claim. Okay, good. Thank you, Joe. Um, next, let's talk a little bit about the forms here. Uh, employer must enter each recordable case in the form within seven calendar days of receiving that information. You may use a similar form to the 300. However, it needs to have the same information, uh, be understandable, uh, and have uh, uh, similar instructions. Forms can be kept on a computer as long as they're produced when they are needed and met in the provision uh, of the standard, which sometimes calls for, you have to be able to provide it within four hours. First is your 300. Um, this is the bread and butter. This is pretty much where all the information pretty much goes into. Um, as I sit down um, with, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, clients and, and, and work with them to, uh, to see what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong, I see, I see the biggest mistake uh, they make is in this area right here, uh, where they classify the, uh, the uh, injury. Um, and, but if you read here, it says classify your injury, check only one box, whichever is the most serious. So you start off first with dead. You know, if the person died or it was a fatality, it will go ahead and mark it here. However, if it wasn't, the next one in line will be days away from work. Um, that takes precedence over job transfer. Um, let's say a person did both, um, you know, was day away from work and then was later on, on a restriction or a job transfer. Well, according to this, it says check one box, the most serious one. So in this case will be 
days away from work. And then here you will go ahead and document the, the information for days away from work or, or, or the job transfer as to how many days. And remember, there's a 180 um, cap. Um, next form is a 301. And um, um, here's where you document what happened. Um, and Angela is probably going to talk to you a little bit about number uh, 15. But one of the things I stress to everybody is try to put as much information down as you can here to help you diagnose what the problem is and come to the root cause. Uh, and that's what you want to do, you know, prevent it from happening again. Um, Angelo will probably talk a little bit more, but uh, he, it does make sense on, on number 15. Um, it's, it's where you uh, tell the story up to pretty much what happened. Angelo, you want to take it from there? Sure. That's the question that um, I think scares all lawyers, um, particularly those who represent a client that is being sued under workers' comp, or perhaps they even try to go outside workers' comp and sue you under your coverage B, which is, you know, there was reckless disregard. Um, and so, um, you know, the example there, worker was sprayed with chlorine when gasket broke during replacement, okay? The only thing that does for you, if you if you make a statement like that, is put you in uh, risk for a, a potential uh, um, um, liability claim. Um, you know, was the gasket bad in the first place, and the uh, maintenance person installed it anyway? Um, did the maintenance person know? Was the maintenance person supervised? And you can see how it, you know, it goes down the line towards, you know, is there, has there been some negligence here? Has there been some reckless disregard? Um, um, <clears throat> so my view in terms of number 15 is to um, be as, as brief and concise as possible. Um, okay, so the, you know, um, I would say something to the effect with respect to the first example, um, um, employee uh, fell off the ladder and injured himself as opposed to ladder slipped on a wet floor. Okay. First of all, we all know that ladder slipped on a wet floor is going to bring you OSHA uh, citations. Uh, it's going to bring you a, a workers' comp claim and, you know, who was monitoring, you know, and why was the floor wet? And, and was there any uh, um, uh, measures taken to avoid uh, putting that ladder on that wet floor, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I think it's important for us to think carefully about what we put in number 15. And that's all I'll say about that. And the next one would be the, um, the 300A. Um, the issue that I see here a lot is uh, the numbers sometimes don't match here. Um, you know, uh, some of the uh, clients that I work with will go ahead and start putting injuries in here. And then all of a sudden, when you get down to this section here, it doesn't match. Uh, they have five injuries here and only three injuries here. Well, something went wrong. Um, also, the, the days away from work uh, sometimes doesn't match and so forth. Um, but the biggest issue here we got here is to ensure that everybody um, is putting in the right information in here. Uh, the average number of employees, as, uh, once again, is the average number. You know, you take the mo most you had and the less you had and, and, and get an average from there, the total amount of hours worked. And it must be certified by a company executive, okay? Uh, you can't be just a safety officer, or it can't be uh, an HR if, if they don't have the authority. It has to be um, a company executive or the owner of, of the company. And the reason they're doing that is because a lot of times, um, you know, maybe a safety director, an HR director, is go ahead and filling this out and winning it and submitting it and OSHA comes on knocking at the door and the owner doesn't even know what's going on. So they want to be able to know that 
hey, I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware of what's going on in my company and they're taking responsibility for it. And last but not least, make sure you post this come February 1st to April 30th. Red line. All right, so yeah, I'll, I'll uh, comment on the redlining. Obviously, um, <clears throat> um, if at some point subsequent to the event, it's determined that uh, it is not recordable, then um, uh, you can redline that particular log item. And so they give you the common example, which is <clears throat> you uh, complete an investigation and you have two physicians, one of whom says it's first aid only. Um, the investigator may initially determine re that it's recordable, but because of the second physician's opinion, <clears throat> it's deemed to be non-recordable. Now, I actually looked through OSHA's uh, site and I found one situation where someone had a heart attack on the work site, resulted in a fatality. <clears throat> OSHA recommends there that you should initially record the event and obviously notify OSHA within eight hours because it was a fatality, um, but that you can then redline it when you later determine that the cause was arterial sclerosis as opposed to anything that, uh, or there was no cause or contributing factor uh, on the work site that um, resulted in the, in the work site based uh, resulted in a heart attack rather based upon the opinions of the uh, of the doctor uh, or the treating physician. So in in that situation, uh, yeah, initially you're going to have to record it and and and, and uh, notify OSHA, um, but uh, it can later be redlined when conflicting information comes in about there being no causation um, in the workplace. Okay, Gabe. All right, let's talk a little bit about covered employees. Everybody knows you know, that every employee in the payroll uh, is covered, um, but employees not on payroll who are supervised on a day-to-day -day basis are included, um, exclude self-employed and partners, and last but not least, uh, any temporary help agencies should not record their cases experienced by temp workers who are supervised by that using firm. So in other words, if you hired uh, you know, a bunch of people and you're actually supervising them on a temporary basis, uh, you're technical uh, responsible for them. And you should be able to log those on your um, 300. Right, and if you're, you're, if you're uh, supervising them um, under all labor law definitions, uh, if you're, you're um, directing their day-to-day -day activities, you are considered the employer. Um, if you have independent contractors, they would not be considered employees for these purposes, though. You need to make sure they're true independent contractors. They meet all the um, criteria that makes them an independent contractor. And again, one of the criteria is whether or not you're directing their day-to-day -day activities. Whenever you direct and supervise their day-to-day -day activities, uh, and I'm not talking about uh, you, know, you telling them what the results are to be or how quickly they're to complete their project, I'm talking about you're supervising uh, the details of how they actually perform their tasks, uh, and that makes them an employee. Um, so um, for a lot of different reasons, we have to be careful about how we designate people as independent contractors versus employees. I see, you know, um, a multitude of, of wage hour cases alleging overtime by people who were wrongly classified as independent contractors. Um, you know, there are state agencies that come in. Uh, for example, uh, I just got one yesterday where <clears throat> an employee uh, or rather an employer 
had a group of individuals who they considered to be independent contractors and the division, uh, the Florida Division of Workers' Compensation came in to audit them uh, and um, they're alleging, the state is alleging that these individuals were wrongly classified because they were supervised on a day-to-day -day basis by the employer and therefore uh, they have to uh, pay not only penalties but all the premiums that they would have had to pay for those individuals under workers, uh, for a workers' comp policy. Uh, and, uh, you know, depending upon the size, that can get into a, a fairly large number. So we need to be careful how we classify employees, uh, not only for uh, whether it's a recordable event, but also for numerous other labor issues that could arise if they're wrongly classified. Okay, Gabe. Okay. Next on the list, uh, fatality catastrophe reporting. As we all know, we must report within eight hours any work-related fatality. And within 24, any work-related amputation, loss of an eye, and or inpatient hospitalization of one or more employees. Remember, it used to be three, now it's one. Uh, you do not need to report highway or public street motor vehicle accidents outside a construction work zone. And you do not need to report any commercial airplanes train sub, subways or bus accidents, uh, transportation accidents. Retention update. Um, you must keep uh, all forms for at least five years following the year that they cover. Um, one good point um, Angelo made um, when we were talking about this is if you have a case that is pending or ongoing, um, or you might want to keep it for longer than that, um, another thing is uh, update any OSHA form during that period and need not update the OSHA 300A or 301. And in the event that any government representatives requires it, uh, you must provide copies of the records, as I mentioned before, within four business hours and use the business hours of the establishment where the records are located. Electronics reporting. Many, but not everybody is, or all the uh, um, uh, employers establishment must electronically report their forms 300A data to the OSHA. Um, according to the OSHA, um, anything, anybody, any company from 2,249 employees are classified in certain industries, must report it. Establishment with over 250 employees must report it. And this must be done and completed by March 2nd of each year. And I, I actually put the link in here of the uh, injury tracking application that's available where they will actually we walk through and, and just uh, put all this information down. Last night, at least, I would like to thank uh, Angelo for um, supporting me. It's not every day I get the luxury of having um, such a, a, a wealth of experience uh, backing me up on this. Um, and also I wanted to mention that uh, USF uh, OTI Center um, is actually gonna be providing an OSHA uh, 7845. Uh, this is a numbered course and it's gonna be on January 19th. Uh, this is gonna be a four hour course. And once again, it provide um, uh, educational credits um, so if you want to go to this website here that you see here, usfoti.ec.org, uh, they will be able to provide you with all the classes that we have available, including the 7845. And Gabe, again, that class is on the 19th of this yes, month, sir. correct? So if they want to register, they need to do that right away. Could you go back one more time just so folks can get the website off that slide real quick? Just Absolutely. give everybody another moment to get that. And uh, folks, I will be sharing this presentation with you both in video format and the PowerPoint presentation that'll be available on our website. It takes about 48 to 72 hours, but you'll have access to all this great info as well. Go ahead, Gabe. I'm sorry. You can go to the next slide. I'm sorry. Yep. And this is where uh, questions can come in. Yeah, I got a few for you guys. Uh, firstly, um, when recording the total number of hours worked by employees, 
on the OSHA 300A form, do you include PTO and sick time paid? Hmm. Okay, maybe I can try to answer that one. I, I'm presuming that the employee has injured themselves in such a way that they need to take time off. And uh, in taking that time off, they utilize their PTO or sick time pay to maintain their pay during the first seven days, let's say, as we all know, workers' comp doesn't pay the first seven days, but they do back, blah, 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 blah. But in any event, so the answer to the question, in my view, in that situation is, yes, those days are recordable, you know, even though they took PTO. Okay, great. Because they're simply taking PTO to, to um, replace their, their, uh, their pay. Uh, the reason why they're out is still because of the incident. Okay, if you got some questions, folks, feel free to post them. Um, let me see here. I have a few that I know were answered. Da, 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 da. All right, here, here's a, here's one. I will, I will. Uh, the question is: Do you stop counting? When do you stop counting restricted days for an employee? Is it the day they had no restrictions or is it when they received their MMI? My opinion would be it would be the day that they uh, have no, no more restrictions. You can reach MMI and still have restrictions or not. Um, and so those restrictions, um, let's say someone has a musculoskeletal, uh, they've reached MMI, they're at the, their best physical condition possible, but still can't lift, according to their provider, over 50 pounds. Well, there's still restrictions, so you're still recording those days. Okay. Hey, if, uh, if someone's admitted to the hospital for observation... Is that not reportable? Is it if it's if someone's admitted only for observation? Is that still reportable? Um, well, it, <laughs> admitted is is obviously what the definition uh, of OSHA. Yeah, and so if they're being admitted, I've seen differing opinions on this. Um, observation you know the question is what what do they mean by observation so um you know if if you've had an incident in which a person um, um has to stay overnight in the hospital for observation because of concerns um over their symptoms then i would say yes okay hey should uh and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys two more questions. First one is, is easy. Next one is multi-part. Should temporary worker hours be included in the total hours reported for workers' comp purposes? I I believe it's for reporting of total hours. For recording uh, purposes. Um... Uh, you're talking about the OSHA 300, right? Yeah. Right. Gabe, I think the answer is yes, right? Yeah. They're temporary mm -hmm. workers. They're out. Um, um, whatever hours they're out as a result of the illness or injury that uh, was work-related, that has to be recorded. Uh, are you talking about just injuries or are you talking about just regular work hours? Regular work hours. Yeah. Yes, they do. For, for the 300? Yes. They are technically paying for that service for those hours. Okay, great. And, uh, and let's see, I've got one last one for you. How far back, how far can you go back to redline a previous recordable case? And they specifically ask if you can go far, as far back as 2019. And the second part, what if the injuries are now healed? Can a physician still reevaluate what the appropriate treatment could or should have been? 
the the uh, the first question is, there's nothing in the regulations which put a limit on um, the time frame in which you can redline. Right. So I would say the answer to that question is yes. Uh, you can redline going back to 215. The only thing they put in there is is if and when you learn about uh, the reason for redlining, that's when you redline. Um, what was the second question again, Carlos? Uh, the second part, excuse me. What if the injuries are now healed? Can a physician still reevaluate what the appropriate treatment could or should have been? Huh. Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, that's really a, a question for a provider, but I think, you know, you, uh, let, me, let me put it this way, and, and this may be helpful. Um, if you have someone who um, has an injury um, and is out of work uh, and the physician says that they're, they're at MMI, um, but um, you know, they can no longer lift 20 pounds even though they're at MMI, and that person, you know, based upon that, can't do your job, um, well, you may want to, for purposes under the ADA, request a second opinion or uh, request a, uh, an FCE. Um, um, the ADA would, would, in that situation, uh, mandate an effort to accommodate. And so your effort to accommodate is, is better served when uh, you um, seek medical opinion as, to po as opposed to um, making your own determination uh, of um, whether that employee can be accommodated. Uh, we're not doctors. I'm not a doctor. I wouldn't tell a client <clears throat> how you can accommodate someone with a restrict, you know, with a restriction that that is ambiguous, or or even if it isn't ambiguous, until they go to uh, get additional medical information, so that we can uh, eliminate uh, the risk of an ADA claim. I hope that helps. I'm, you know, I'm not. Again, the provider basically is going to make the determination in most of those instances. All right. Well, thank you to the two of you. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, we appreciate you giving us your time today. Uh, again, folks, this presentation is going to be made available to you all um, via our website in 48 to 72 hours. And we'll be sending you a reminder email. Uh, and also with registration for next month where our guests will be Willis Towers Watson. Um, so that's going to be on February 10th. So um, before you go, just want to let you all know our Contractors and Clays event is back. Um, we're going to be going to Quail Creek uh, Plantation on March 19th. That is a Friday. So if you go on our website, www.sfagc.org and click on the events menu, You'll see the registration for that event is up. I really look forward to having a ton of you there. It's very popular within the safety community. Um, thank you, Brian Trusky. I see you out there in the chat. Thank you to all of you who are participating in the chat. You know, that's the one thing we miss from being in person is yeah. you all being able to interact with one another. Um, so I'm really happy to see some of you really putting that to practice in our chat feature. It keeps our community strong, which is really what this was all about from the get-go. A um, couple final thank yous. Again, Gabe and Angelo, thank you for taking this time to speak with us today. Milwaukee Tools, thank you for your support of, uh, of our safety sessions. Kelly Cronenberg, to the whole team behind the scenes, thank you all very much. Um, Safe Right Solutions, thank you for hosting us. Um, and the members of our safety committee, Deborah Hampton, Ian Schwartz, Jose Bobadilla, Mark Leon, Enrique Sequeira, Brian Cardona, and anybody who had a high-level involvement. Like my boy, Brian, thank you again for coming on and working with all of us there on the chat. Um, we, we love having everybody up here and engaged. It's important. Um, that's it, folks. Have yourself a wonderful day. Please stay safe out there. You know, coronavirus isn't going away. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, infection rates are way, way, way high. So make sure you keep protecting yourselves and your employees out there on the job site. I have a lot of pride although I am not a safety director. I'm just a pretty face here at the AGC. 
but I have a lot of pride of being part of your group and all the work you have done for the construction industry, um, you know, to keep everyone safe, especially compared to other industries and, and what's going out there in the public. So thank you all very much. See you guys in a few weeks. Um, if you have any questions, you know where to reach us. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carlos. Bye, guys. Bye. Take care. Thank you, guys. Have a great day.